Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Glad to have you here for today's webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about navigating the technician shortage. Uh, my name is John Phelps. I'm the Director of Channel Partnerships with Techmetric. But uh, before we get started and uh, bring in our guests here, uh, a little, little quick piece of housekeeping. Uh, hopefully, uh, we want this to be participatory. So if you do have some questions, feel free uh, to go ahead and post those into the chat. We will have somebody monitoring that for us. Um, if we don't get to those during the session, uh, someone will be reaching out to you later. So whether it's about the topic at hand or, or really anything that comes to mind while we have you here, we'd love to be able to touch on all of those. Uh, so please do utilize the chat feature uh, for that. Uh, and then lastly, the webinar is actually going to be recorded and it will be sent to everybody here uh, after the broadcast. So you can review it later if you would like. Um, and we hope that you do. But uh, with that, I'd like to uh, bring in our guest today. Uh, we potentially have a second guest joining us, um, but I want to bring in Mike Collins, owner of Collins Auto Repair, um, and he's uh, going to be joining us here. And uh, like I said, we may have Todd Hayes pop on here in a little bit as well. And uh, I don't want to butcher anybody's introduction. I'd rather hear it from, from the person themselves. So, uh, Mike, why don't you go ahead and you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your shop, uh, how long you've been in business, what got you started, uh, and, and let everybody know. Okay. My name is Mike Collins. I own Collins Auto Care here in Houston, Texas. I originally started my shop back in 1999 and we started off as a performance shop. In 2012, we branched off and started doing general automotive as well. Um, at that point, um, a couple years later, we realized we needed to get away from performance and get, you know, go all in as far as uh, general automotive. We felt really felt like we could grow more that way and that we could also help a lot more people that way. Very cool. So how, how long have you been doing just uh, general automotive and not performance? We really sliced it off. So in 2012, we, you know, we went about half and half and then we just kind of started slowing down the performance. So it was kind of a gradual stop. Um, in 2017, we basically kind of did a hard stop. And <clears throat> unless somebody was on our waiting, like we finished our waiting list. But at that point, everything intake going forward from 2017 and up has just been general automotive. <clears throat> gotcha. Well, uh, uh, hopefully that's been uh, going pretty well for you, making the move from performance. I know there's some so there's some niche sides to the market and uh, different different business strategies can attract some different uh, technicians, which is exactly what we're, we're going to be talking about here today. So I'm curious, you know, how many technicians do you currently have at your shop? We currently have six technicians and one GS. Um, in addition to them, we also have three QC techs, which, you know, do our quality control before, you know, we, we finish it up with the with the customer. Gotcha. Now, is that uh, is that more or less than you had back when it was performance? Uh, oh, do you have some way more. <laughs> way more. <laughs> Usually, that is what you see, right? There's maybe a, a fewer car count shops, smaller uh, in terms of technician count, but uh, can be just as busy on the performance side. So it's it's way more. Do you have any of them that have uh, stuck around through it all, or uh, I has it been very different? How many uh, How many of those that have been with you that whole time? I have I have two that have stayed with me the the, the entire time. One of them was kind of a in and out guy. With the performance world but as soon as we went you know full-blown um general automotive that enabled us to grow enough to get to the point where we had we were able to offer you know really good benefits and health care and stuff and so he wow. came to me and said can i come on full time i want health care so that that was a big a big push for that and then i have another guy that's been with me 10 years so oh, wow. he's, yeah, he's i can only imagine the uh the decision making process and then being able to have something like full benefits and how much easier that makes somebody's decision to uh to come on board at a, at a shop uh really any position for that matter well um on that i'm curious do you consider yourself with six technicians do you consider yourself fully staffed are you are you looking for more um and you know how did you get to that number if you if you do consider yourself full up so we we are currently fully staffed. We do have room for more. Um, I tend to grow. I, I'll grow to a certain point, then bring in the technicians, make sure we're honestly a little bit overstaffed for that. And then we start growing a little bit more and work on the front. And, and then once we get the front good, we bring in more in the back. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a seesaw type effect. We never just throw it all in like that. We want to make sure we're giving really good service to the customers. So, no, absolutely. That's uh, it. Almost sounds like a chicken or the egg thing, right? How do you make that determination on uh, on when you need to fill uh, the front end versus you know the shop side of things? Um, so, so I'm curious. You know, what is when you do make the determination? 
when you say, you know what, we, we do need to grow in the shop and I need to increase uh, my technician count. What is what is your process in order to find more techs? I know that may be very in depth and, and we can kind of peel those layers back here as we go, but what is your initial process in order to uncover and find more technicians for your shop? Um, my process has changed quite a bit in the past couple of years, um, really about the past year and a half. I used to do what a lot of people did and, oh no, we need a technician. Let me throw a bunch of ads out there and then hope somebody shows up. Um, in today's, today's market, you, you can't do the old school ways anymore. It's not one of those, if you build it, they will come. Um, my, my process now is I have a bench, um, but it's taken me a while to build a bench. Um, I have over a hundred technicians that are actively on our bench that we can pull from. That doesn't mean that all of them are ready to leave a job right now or anything, but we have that list of names of people that were, you know, we're at least interested enough that they made that cut. Um, but it took a lot of work to get to that point. Um, Matter of fact, I had gotten to a point where I could not find techs and I was I, I was beating myself up saying this massive tech shortage. You know, wh what are we going to do about it? Right. And I had a friend kind of call me out on it. And he goes, you know, he looked at me and goes, Mike, are you you know, you're desperate for techs. Have you gone scorched earth approach on this? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking I have ads. And he goes, no, 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 no. Like, have you really gone scorched earth? And I <clears throat> kind of sat back and had to look at myself and go, you know what? I haven't like I haven't treated this as seriously as I really should, because the, this this market is different. You know, it, it, we're, we're in different times now, so we have to adapt. And so at that point, I met with my general manager. We sat down. We had a meeting and said, look, this is what we're going to do. If we need technicians, we're going to treat this like a full time job, not just during business hours, full time job. If somebody you know, if we need to interview somebody at 10 o'clock at night, we're going to go meet them. If we need to meet them on a weekend, if we you know a Saturday or Sunday or something like that, we're going to meet them. Um, we're going to text, we're going to call, we're going to pursue. We're not going to do the old school way of if, if a technician ghosts you, which happens a lot, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not just going to go, oh, well, they weren't worth it anyway. No, you know, technicians have a different mindset, you know, it, just, just a different way of doing things. And sometimes they are looking at jumping on a job, you know, jumping and leaving their jobs based upon what their mood is that day. So you catch them on a bad day, they're ready to go. You catch them on a great day, you know, and those, those two things may be a day apart. So we leave them on our list and we continue calling them. <clears throat> okay. You're just giving me a number of uh, other questions, but you know, last week, literally last week, I was at an event up outside of Philadelphia and there was roughly 50 shop owners uh, at that event at the same time. And, you know, somebody asked the question to the crowd, who here considers themselves fully staffed? And out of that entire room, there was one shop owner that actually raised their hand and kind of took somebody by surprise. A lot of people by surprise because most people say, you know, you can never be fully staffed. But to hear a, a bench of upwards of 100 people, I want to I want to focus on that for just a moment, because how often do you say you go back to that bench? Is it something that you try to keep a, you know, a monthly, a quarterly touch point with everybody? Um, and if and when you do. What's the success that you have? Like you mentioned, you know, technicians can kind of ghost you a little bit. And that's really anybody for that matter, right? I don't, uh, it was a good idea at the time and now I don't want to. So question one, I guess, is how often do you go back and make sure it's up to date? And then question two, what's your success rate in converting a bench player to a star player? So our top 25, we shoot them an email once a month or a, a text message once a month. <clears throat> and it's not a, hey, come on board. It is a, hey, how are you doing? You know, how's it going over there? What have you been up to? Um, beyond that, we touch base with them once a quarter. We just fire a random. Now, the entire one, we will text the entire list. We text on every holiday telling them, you know, happy 4th of July. You know, we may send them a picture of, you know, us off on the weekend and barbecuing with the family or something, you know, something like that. Um, but that top 25 is those are the ones that like we want to we want to pursue at some point. Maybe we're just not ready to bring them in. Um, now, as far as when it's time to bring one in, that really depends on the, the seesaw effect. Um, whenever we want to step on the gas, some, we're going to want to get somebody in there before we really throttle that up to make sure that we can take care of the, the customers. I'd rather throw a bunch mm -hmm. of money at them right off, you know, right off the get go and not have the cars to feed them. But the thing, the truth of the matter is, is we always have the cars to feed them, you know, our marketing we really kind of have unlimited hours here for techs. So 
Well, that that's another good thing to hear, right? The old adage goes, if you want to sell more hours, you got to hire more techs, right? You want to sell more cars, you got to hire more salespeople at the same time. Um, and so when did you make that determination? Uh, and in terms of that, that revelation that you talked about, say, have you really gone scorched earth? And then from that point, how long do you think it took you to get to the the hundred person bench that you talked about? That was actually fairly quick to get to that, you know, hundred hundred person bench. Now that's not to say that that list was perfect <laughs> when we had, you know, when we initially made the list, cause we have sure. dropped it off and we just kind of maintain it. That's, that's just our magic number that we like to keep on it. But if we have somebody come up that we like, we'll throw them up higher in the list and then the bottom person drops off. Um, as far as how long it took to get that, it was, I mean, we've been keeping track of our, you know, our interviews and things like that and an Excel spreadsheet for, for a number of years. Okay. We just didn't start applying that bench technique until about a year and a half ago and sort of kind of treating it a little bit different. So what, why hundred? What, uh, what's significant about that number? If anything, is it a nice it, round number? It's, it's a nice round number and we just hit it really quickly. Um, so part of the reason my friend had, had asked me if I'd gone scorched earth was because we were in a big shop. We had a big shop culture issue. So I'm huge on culture. We had really great culture and um, for a long time. And then I made I made some personnel mistakes and um, it kind of really turmoiled our culture here, you know, about a year and a half ago. And I made the decision to clean house. So I had a meeting with every single technician in the back and you know, it was a, a couple of them survived. Most of them didn't survive the, the conversation we had. Um, so I wanted to fill the shop up and that's what we did. We just treated it full time, you know, nonstop. We had over 80 interviews in a two week period of time. Um, that's a full time job, right? In person interviews, not not counting phone interviews. That was in person. Right. And we fully staffed the shop really, really quick. Um, that's not. And, and again, that's not to say 100 percent of those people made it. You know, a few of them came in. We're here for a month or so. A couple of them came in. We're here for a day or so. And, we're, you know, you're always going to get somebody that you hire. They come in and you realize their resume is outshines their person. You know, so it um, we, we kind of did that. And then that's where, you know, that's where we really got to that hundred mark, looked at it and said, let's maintain this hundred. And, you know, let's focus on the 25, the top 25. And let's just keep the names on the other, you know, the other 75. You kind of hit on a word that I, I wanted to get to, and I'm glad you did uh, and to give me a nice little segue because, you know, you mentioned people in general, and I don't want to single out just the text, but people in general can be a little finicky and, and the way the wind blows, maybe, you know, they're, they're looking for another job for whatever reason, right? It was a bad day at work and, and all of that. And, and it does boil down to that culture. And I'm curious how you would describe your shop's culture now and, and is that a description from your eyes? Do you feel it's a, an accurate description from your technicians and all your, your employees' eyes? But how would you describe your shop's culture currently? So we, if you, you know, I did I did one of these interviews probably a year and a half ago, a year ago, and I, I would have told you I had perfect culture. And you hit on something really good there. That was from my eyes. Gotcha. And I read, I read the room wrong. Um, you know, we were doing some things that, that we thought were cool, like mandatory book clubs, you know, where we would, you know, we would all be reading the same book and we would meet weekly on it and things like that. Um, everybody seemed to participate like we thought it was good. Peel the layers back and realize, uh oh, this isn't this isn't 100 percent what I thought it was. Now, you know, I would invite you to walk through my shop and talk to any one of our technicians. We do a voluntary book club now and gotcha. we have almost, you know. Out of all my people, I've got a list of I had them sign up and they can leave at any, you know, at any given point. But we meet weekly. And, you know, if we're late on a meeting or if we have to reschedule a book club meeting, they're hitting us up going, hey, we, you know, we missed book club this week. We, you know, when are we going to do it? When are we going to reschedule it? And so the whole team gets up here and we we discuss the books that, that we're reading. You know, we just finished uh, Atomic Habits. Uh, we did Crucial Conversations right before that. You know, a lot of the technicians are really into this because we're taking, you know, we all take the time together to book club. Isn't just talking about the book. It's also talking about their personal lives and things right. that they're, they're going through. And so they get to talk in a group setting of what is going on in their life and how could, you know, how can they improve it? So, you know, we get lots of smiles. Now we get a lot, you know, the technicians constantly helping each other. You know, I 
looking out the window right now and I've got three techs under a car helping each other and not one of them is going to ask for extra hours to help that other tech because they know that tech is going to help them too. You know, culture is one of those things that, it, you know, it can't just be cooked up in a kitchen, right? Like, like you were mentioning, it's got to be somewhat organic, um, if not totally organic to, in order to get to that point, because, you know, one side it's, it's too fun and nobody gets any work done. The other side is you feel like it's fun. It's too strict and nobody's, it's one of those that uh, it sounds like you you kind of had a revelation and things that uh, they really started to fall into place for you. And and I'm curious if you feel that that is intertwined with the way that you've gone about recruiting. And so I'm curious, what is your process? Right. If you when you made that determination, what was your step one uh, and, and how has that evolved over time? And how does it sit today? Right. If you know that you need to replenish the bench, um, what, what is the process and how do you go about that? So one of the things I do is I always run ads, um, employment ads, even okay. if I'm not looking. Um, I'm not as active on them if I'm not, you know, actively looking for somebody and talking, you know, even talking to the bench because the bench isn't always going to generate, you know, if, if it's if it's a perfect world and the stars align, the bench will generate somebody. We'll hit one of those guys up and somebody will say, yeah, I'm ready. Let me come talk to you. Um, okay. But sometimes you'll go through 25 people and go, you know, I need this position, this type of technician. And those are those are the ones that kind of tend to sit in that top 25. Um, and if none of them are ready to go, you know, we got to have those ads constantly going so that we're in front of people. Um, right. Now, if I'm not looking, actively looking and talking to people, I'll just let, you know, I'll, I'll just renew it like once every few weeks. Now, if I'm looking for somebody, I will renew that ad twice a day. Because the way Indeed and some of the other ones work is it you throw your ad up and 10 other people, yours goes down and yours may go to page two or three. So we just continue like throwing the ads up twice a day. That way, anybody that's looking, we're pretty fresh on it. Um, that's that's, uh, that's interesting to know. And I also know, and without getting into too many dollars and cents, it doesn't have to be expensive to do that, does it? I mean, you can, you can certainly do that and, and, and pay all you want to do that. But at the same time, you can also do so without breaking the bank and, and, and spending all the money to keep those ads up top. And then maybe that's your experience as well, at least from, from what I've seen and heard, uh, there's a lot of shops that have been successful with it without having to just drain their funds and all of the, all of the money they work so hard every month to, uh, to earn. Absolutely. So what about the actual interview process? Because recruiting is one thing, right? Getting your name out there and getting people to want to come work for you. But what about your interview process? Is, is do you, how many, how many steps are there? Who else is involved in your shop? I mean, surely it's not just you. Um, do you include your manager, obviously, but all the way down to technicians? What is that process that you have? So it generally starts with me. It, it, it kind of depends. If, I, if, if we're looking, depending on what level player we're looking at. So the first thing I'll tell everybody is you have to believe in yourself if you're interviewing somebody. Technicians can smell confidence. You know, they can smell strength. And if they're stronger than you are, if they believe that, they're going to come in and run your shop if you hire them. So they, you know, a good level technician needs to believe that you know what you're doing. So most of people, most people that run their shops, I, I hope you guys know what you're doing. I'm sure you do. You got to believe it. Not only do you have to believe it, but you have to sit there and convince the technicians that you believe it. And you got to sell them your vision. If you can't sell them your vision, you're not going to get them. Some other, some other person's going to get them. I don't always pay my technicians higher than what they're making now. A lot of, you know, I used to think, oh, you have to pay them higher to get them to leave. That's, that's not true at all. If you sell your vision correctly, you can pay them, you know, a, like we have levels, you know, we have technician levels. And that's one of the things that we communicate with technicians from the get go is which level do you fit in? And each level has certain ASC uh, certifications, requirements, uh, amount of training, continued education per year, so forth and so on. And each level has their own. So we'll we'll slide that across the table and say, what level do you fit in? Because that's what the pay range is. And and going forward, you know what your expectations are. If you want to go to a higher level, this here are the requirements to get to that next level. Um, and all that's tied in with, you know, it, it's really clear cut, but it's tied in with continuing education, ASC certifications, um, even amount of, you know, hours they're turning. Now, do you feel that that's helped in the uh, in the way of retaining technicians? Because getting them can be one thing, but as we mentioned earlier, keeping them can be another. And 
you don't necessarily want somebody that has another $5 an hour on top of you to, to woo them away. Um, that can be one thing for retention, but it, otherwise, is there anything that you're doing specifically on the retention side of things to keep your technicians? And again, to your point, aside from just a, an annual $3 raise per hour, what, what are your, what is your retention strategy? I should say. So nobody wants to be stuck. Like, we've all had jobs where we've worked and you're like, this is what it is. But technicians, just like shop owners, we're, you're go, 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 go. You have to be growing. And if you don't set clear paths for a technician to grow, they're going to feel stuck, even if you just give them a little bit of money. And if they feel like that, you're going to lose them the money. And if you lose them the money, you haven't set up something to help them grow their personal life. You know, if you set up a structured plan, people tend to get excited by that. They're like, oh, I have goals to work for. Let me let me go through this. Oh, I want to hit this next level. What do I need to do that? Like, I know I need to do this. They'll, you know, they'll meet with you and go, okay, which training can I do? How, what path can I set up? And we'll set that up with them, which constantly keeps them engaged. It constantly keeps them feeling like they're self-improving because they are. Right. And that makes them enjoy their job because they're enjoying their life and their growth. Now, that's interesting because you're right. It doesn't it, it's something to work towards. Right. The, the goal is some, you know, it's a set of accomplishable tasks in order to get the desired end result. That's the I guess the Webster's definition of it or something of that nature. So uh, giving them that that next step to strive for, um, I can I can assume is his working uh, wonders for you and, and probably work wonders for a lot of people if they if they had that in place. Now, um, we mentioned before we kind of went on live that I did not, I swear, did not bribe you and or ask you to have something up on the screen behind you. Um, but I want to <laughs> utilize that specifically to ask a question about processes, because any, you know, you have a technician, they likely have experience. You can go grow them from the ground up, but you're probably bringing somebody with experience and experience creates habits, some good, some not so good. Um, and a change regardless is probably in the works for, for somebody with those habits. So I guess the question in all of that is, what are some of the processes that you have your technicians do every single car, right? Every single customer, every single time, the whole 300% rule, however we want to put it. Um, and how has that been received specifically when it's a change to what they're used to in the past? Is it something to do with digital vehicle inspections? Is it a number of, of pictures that they have to take? What are those requirements and um, processes that you have them fulfill on a per car basis? So it's funny because I originally bought all of my tech's tablets okay. and handed them all out. was really happy, made sure to get the one with the flash and everything else. They hated the tablets. They liked their phones because it's easy to carry it in their pocket. So. To start with, you know, as they're going out to get the to get their initial vehicle, they walk around the car. They take pictures of the outside of the car with their phone, um, hop in the car, jot down the mileage right there, you know, because they can do that straight into TechMetric. Um, you know, they're begin essentially what they're doing is they're beginning the DVI at that point. You know, then once they get it pulled in, we require, you know, we require we have a 43 point DVI okay. and we do those on every single car with a very few exceptions. Um, there's a couple exceptions to those rules, but you know, for the most part, any car that's coming in here is going to get a 43 point DVI. Um, they are taking a minimum of seven pictures per car, whether it's good or bad. Um, I read somewhere along the lines in TechMetric that seven's like the magic number, have at least seven. And <laughs> right. Um, so th that's what our requirement is. Um, and as far as, you know, it's beyond that, our technicians actually, we have them write up the entire quote. They're looking at parts wow. and looking at labor. Um, okay. That is a huge adjustment for our technicians whenever they first come in. But it's pretty, it's pretty cool because once, you know, they'll start asking around the other technicians, hey, does this get faster? Like, this seems like it's slowing me down. And all my other technicians tell them, trust me, you want to do this because the parts are always right. They're always here. And, you know, oh, yeah. you, you're not relying on somebody messing something up. So you, you will be faster. Um, so the other technicians will actually help them learn how to do things quicker. Um, they, the, the technicians can build a, you know, a quote faster than I can. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I don't work the front counter anymore, so I stumble through them, but, um, you know, doing that has sped up the technicians. And like I said, it's made the parts 
correct when they come in and it's made sure that they're not missing stuff. Um, they're also able to go through and do the labor. They can hand off, once they do that, then they'll hand off to the service advisor. The service advisor will go through, check, make sure, you know, do whatever they need to do to the pricing, right. verify availability, and then send it through. So not only does it speed up the technicians, it also gives our service advisors more time to spend and build relationships with the customers because that's the number one job of a service advisor is building a relationship. You know, it's it's not to sit there and look at parts and stuff like that. Um, I do have a parts manager that handles all the other stuff to pull it away from the service advisors because I want the service advisors talking and building relationships. That's like I want that to be their only job. And I can assume that having the technicians do that, that uh, the estimate building hasn't done anything negatively to your gross profit percentage or anything like that, or else you probably wouldn't wouldn't keep going with that route. So while I know that there's there's shops out there like you that do that, uh, you know, that's uh, it's one of those maybe not as common uh, because to your point feels like they should just be on the car the entire time. But it's the, it's the footsteps, the literal and figurative footsteps, as I usually say, that, that can be saved by doing things right the first time and having the, the resources and tools at your disposal uh, that make it that much easier. So I, I am curious, though, ha had you utilized in your recruitment and in your interview process, maybe to sell yourself in your shop, um, the features that you have, such as digital vehicle inspection, to where you can text your customers, to where things are a little bit more automated with your shop management system. Has that been in any part of part of your uh, interview process, recruitment process? And how did technicians that maybe not have seen that before, or maybe had very little interaction with a previous shop management system, how are they responding to that when uh, when they do uncover what you've got in your shop? So I used to do, I used to put more of that in there. I, it, it's kind of a a sub thing in my, you know, one of the benefit th type things we do in our ads. It's not mm -hmm. a high point anymore. It used to be because, you know, Techmetric wasn't in every shop everywhere now. You know, now it's pretty much everywhere. So it's it's a lot more common. You know, a lot more technicians, you know, come in. It's it's rare that we see somebody that doesn't already do a DVI of some form at at previous shops. Sure. So that's not as big of a thing. We do walk through it, but even even in the interview process, when we're showing them what we do, we, uh, you know, that's even kind of shortened up because we're getting a lot more. Yeah, yeah, we, you know, I, I've seen that. We've done, you know, I did this over at this shop and this shop and this shop. So, gotcha. So, I mean, you know, we still don't get me wrong. We still walk into a number of shops where there's a whole lot of uh, pen and paper uh, laying around and, and stacks of it. And so that adjustment can be can be pretty difficult, but um, especially with who we're trying to serve in the future, right? Not just today, but obviously a lot of people today. However, moving forward, that's going to be more and more prevalent uh, with, with employees as well as customers to, to have that type of resource at your disposal to where the efficiency is in mind. And it, you know, having a product that works both for the shop as well as for the end consumer, hopefully, uh, hopefully has served you well and, and continues to do so. It does. The customers love, like the customers really love the digital communication, you know, and, and we even do the digital communication with our waiters. Like we do, we do a hybrid of digital communication with sending them the inspections and stuff, as well as walking them out to the car. Um, so every single one of our customers gets copies directly to their phone of the digital inspections along with, you know, quotes and things like that, even if we're talking to them. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, we're, we're winding down here with the, with a minute or so left and, and trying to look through the questions that have come through. And I think we've, we've been able to, uh, to answer a number of them and, and we may have some follow-ups that come in after the fact, but I guess one of the bigger ones that I'm, and I'm seeing is where did you get the hundred? You mentioned indeed, uh, you know, you kind of go back to the, how you built the bench? What's the uh, biggest bang for the buck? Where where are the where's the impact coming from with getting those technician applications? So my two biggest impacts, um, you know, of course you do get word of mouth and you do get you know your text, no other text, and things like that. Those are always my favorite because you know somebody that knows them. But my two biggest impacts, and these are the two ones that I really concentrate on, um, is ZipRecruiter and Indeed. And I don't do the you know, on Indeed, I don't do the, the the monthly subscriptions or things like that. I do the paper, you know, paper resume. So if you you put it out, they send you a resume, you get, you know, I think it's 72 hours to decline that resume. If you don't like it, you decline it. You don't pay for it. You only pay for the ones you want to keep. So 
I don't spend as much as I used to when I had the monthly subscription, even though I get way more resumes. Now, I also get way more resumes I don't want to look at, but, you know, those are easy rejects. You know, it's Fair just enough. Yeah. quick and you know, <laughs> turn it away. Yeah, um, you, it's definitely some stuff to, to call it weed through, right? Filter through and, and find the ones that are actually uh, going to have an impact on your business. So, And you have to, like, you, you have to read them and you have to read, like, it takes time. Like, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, lie to anybody here or make, you know, give anybody false representation of anything. It takes time. If you are looking for a technician, if you need a technician, you have got to go all in. You have to treat it like a full-time job. I promise you there are a ton of techs out there, but you have to do it every day. You have to do it constantly. The worse you, you know, you're needing a tech, the more time you're going to have to spend doing it. And I know a lot of, I know a lot of shop owners spend a lot of time working in their shop you're going to have to do it after hours, you know, go, go back, think about when you first opened your shop, how much extra work you had to put in. It's not permanent, but it has to be right now. If you need a technician, go all in. They are out there. I promise you're just going to have to go way beyond your normal hours and your, your normal way of thinking. Times are different. People are different. Like it's harder to find people than it used to be, but they are out there. We just have to get more creative. Well, I, I don't know a better way to end it other than saying thank you, Mike, for your time. Very much appreciate it. I mean, time flies when you're having fun. I don't, I don't know how we're already at the 30 minute mark, but I do want to be respectful of your time. I know you're in the shop and you're still uh, you got a business to run. So uh, first of all, again, thank you uh, for joining me here and, and being a good sport and answering all those questions and giving people kind of a, a peek behind the curtain and how you've gotten to the point where, you know, you may not feel the effects of a tech shortage as long as you're actively working against it and, and being proactive with it instead of waiting till the end until you absolutely need one. So uh, kudos to you on, on getting to that point. And again, thank you so much for, uh, for being here with us. And um, I know there's going to be some follow-up questions, right? We've already got some that, uh, that we weren't able to get to. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll get those answered for everybody. So without, uh, without any further ado, Mike, again, thank you. We appreciate it. And uh, we hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks for having me, John. I appreciate it. Absolutely.